My wife isn't here today. She has a cough and a fever, and she didn't want to share it with anybody. But she is online, so, hi, honey. <laughs> but you might pray also for Felix. I know Felix would very much like to be here also, but unfortunately, uh, he hopes next week, so you might pray for him also. As far as the thing goes for Amazon, Rita went online and did it, and apparently it's quite simple. You read the instructions. So that is always good. Second Peter 3.10. Get all the pieces back in place. A month ago I gave a sermon entitled, What Manner of Persons Should We Be? It was based on Second Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That is the end of the age, right before New Jerusalem comes down to earth. The physical earth that we know it will have served its purpose. All traces of man's civilizations will be gone. God's plan of salvation will have been complete. Every person who has ever lived will have had a chance to be in the kingdom of God. The third resurrection will be history. Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? Then Peter continues, in holy conduct and godliness. What manner of people should we be? Part 2 is the title of this sermon. As you all know, I'm a drinker. <laughs> Genesis 3, 1. You know, this subject has been on my mind a great deal lately, I think. As you get older, it really hits home that you're not going to be around forever. And above all else, we need to be right with God. But let's start at the beginning with Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent, Satan was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God has made. Have you ever seen a nature series on uh, some uh, creature like a fox and everything? They can be extremely cunning. He said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan asked an innocent question for not so innocent motive. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. It was a lie, of course. You could say, he looked pleased, straightened his face, smiled, and lied to her. But he was faced with a problem. Who should she believe, the serpent or God? For we know that in the day they eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Satan did not say, follow me, not God. Satan told Adam and Eve that they could make their own decisions. He appealed to their vanity and carried the day. By accepting that reasoning, Adam and Eve were following Satan's mindset, probably without realizing what they're doing. And that decision has plagued the world ever since. Let me put it as simply as I can. We do have a God-given right to choose what we are going to do. And those choices, if we violate God's law when doing so, can bring us great riches and fame. But that usually the exception, not the rule. And it is for a limited period of time. But we cannot dictate the spiritual consequences of our actions. 
God in Proverbs 14, 12 said, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death, spiritual death. The way of man, our way, other than God's way, cannot bring us eternal life. For what profit of a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You might mark, put down Mark 8.36 for that scripture. 1 Peter 5.8 Whether follow God or follow Satan on this world is a question we face every day of our lives. God wants people that have the dedication and conversion when faced with decisions will, under all circumstances, choose his way. That's kind of hard to do, because oftentimes, whether we like it or not, we stumble. But our intent, to the best of our ability, is to follow God's way. It is no accident that God warns us at the very beginning what a cunning and deceitful opponent we have in Satan. That warning is also found in the New Testament, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeing who he can, may devour. The NIV says, be self-controlled and alert. Adam Clark's commentary says, be sober. Avoid drunkenness of your senses and drunkenness of your souls. Do not be overcharged with the concerns of the world. You know, that's awful hard to do, especially when you read uh, what's going on in the world. Because there's not much good news out there. Be vigilant. Awake. Keep awake. Be always watchful. Never be off your guard. Your enemies are alert. They are never off theirs. End of quote. God wants us to recognize just how dangerous this world is to our eternal life. I want to read you a quote from a book by Thomas Cahill entitled Mysteries of the Middle Ages. It is speaking of the impact of Greek culture on Judaism and early Christianity. Early Christianity. It's a little wordy. Quote, for both Jews and later Christians, will come to live within the prevailing Greco-Roman cultural context and it is virtually impossible for a minority cultures to avoid absorbing and internalizing the principal values of the majority culture in which they move and breathe, whose language they speak and whose vocabulary becomes the currency of daily life. End of quote. Luke 12:16. This quote shows us what enormous impact the culture that we live in has on us. Modern communications is a marvel to behold. We have the internet, Facebook, Twitter, the list goes on and on. And I think the primary danger of all this is it is a good way to waste your time. And once that time is gone, you can never get it back. There are no do-overs. How many people wish that there were do-overs, that when they make a mistake, that they could go back in time and do it again with making the right decisions? Doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Most important is the knowledge that we can overcome this culture. We cannot overcome this culture without God's help. It is impossible. God wants his people that's you and I, to understand the dangers of this world. And we need to ask God daily to help us understand how subtle Satan's impact is. There's hardly a television show out there that is some way not perverted in some way. If you're not careful, it will get into your mind and it's hard to get it out. And we need to ask God daily to help us understand exactly how subtle Satan can be. And I mean us personally. And I put myself at the top of the list. We have to dedicate our lives to seeking God's kingdom. And we must never take anything for granted. 
I've been taking another look at the phrase, a tree desirable to make one wise. It shows an attitude that has affected the religions of the world for millennia. And that is the idea that power can be had through the possession of a physical object. The tree in the garden could not make one wise. The choice was between obeying God or not obeying God. And down through the ages, people have gone on the quest for the Holy Grail. Here's a quote from History.com. From the Knights of the Middle Legends to Indiana Jones, the Holy Grail has been the most sought after Christian relic in popular culture for centuries. The Grail is most commonly identified as the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper and that Joseph of Arimathea used to collect Jesus' blood when he was crucified. Find that in the Bible. Given the importance of Jesus' crucifixion, the search for the grail became the holiest of quest as it signified the pursuit of union with God. End of quote. Indiana Jones and the last and the Raiders of the Lost Ark made hundreds of millions and started a movie franchise worth billions. Those of you who have not seen the movie, and there are people in the United States that have not actually seen the movie, is the Ark from the Holy of Holies, supposedly. But Indiana Jones got one thing right. Trying to use the Ark for ungodly purpose resulted in their death. People would still like to search Mount Ararat to find Noah's Ark. Finding it would be an interesting proof of the accuracy of the Bible. Finding it will not automatically get you into the kingdom of God. Finding it will not give you the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It would be my guess that they found it, the Roman Catholic Church would use it to their advantage. Luke 12, 16. God expects his people to have the right priorities. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid out for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He thought he had it made. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will require of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? You know, it was in the news lately, but you know, Conrad Hilton, who owned the Hilton Hotels, made an enormous fortune. But his uh, children, who inherited all the money, haven't been so fortunate in their lives. He read the latest episode of his son, or grandson, I guess it is, who disrupted an airplane flight and everything, made a complete fool of himself and everything, got himself arrested. He said, oh, it's because I took a sleeping pill. Yeah, well, sleeping pill is supposed to put you to sleep, not <laughs> wake you up. But he's in serious uh, things. So having all that money really didn't do him a lot of good. But God, well, so it is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. It has to do with priorities. The next part is how we are supposed to think and do. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, or what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, for they have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. And how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature? If I grew from all the times I worried about things, I would probably be playing the NBA at uh, about nine feet. I always tell people not to worry about it, you know. I can, I, my job is to worry, and I can do it for all of us. <laughs> I also tell Mr. Tuck, 
Every time he leaves, not to worry, we can screw up without him. <laughs> it doesn't seem to comfort him too much. I just hope he's not listening today. <laughs> it's not telling us to sit around and do nothing, and God will provide for us. When you have your priorities straight, and your main goal is the kingdom of God, then God will make sure your needs are being met. Notice I said needs, not wants. We went through the Dave Ramsey course, the FAU, and we were having a, trying to set our priorities in knowing exactly what our needs are and differentiate that from our wants. Because my wants are many. And that's, every time you turn on the television set, they got an advertisement to convince you that you cannot live without a product you may not know have even existed before you turn on the TV. <laughs> and it gets you, you know, notice they, they show a nice, beautiful car, clean, with somebody driving it, usually a beautiful woman or a handsome young man driving the thing. What they don't tell you is the price and how long you're going to pay that thing. They leave that off. I like my car. It's a 2001 Mitsubishi, almost 200,000 miles on it, and it's paid for. Thank you. But I treat that thing like a baby. You know, I expect it to last a long time. We do not have to worry about things that are beyond our control. There's some things that we do have. I already wore out one of these interpreters now that are going to the second one. <laughs> That's super califragic expedialidocious. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'll repent later, okay? You know, however, many of our. Hey, you're supposed to be interpreting this, right? <laughs> however, many of our problems we bring, we bring on ourselves, unfortunately. These are the ones we should and can avoid. Verse 26, but you then are not able to do the least. Why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you, a little faith? Faith is a great blessing. And we're told in Hebrews that but without faith it is impossible to please him. That's Hebrews 11.6. God expects his people to have faith. Do we ask constantly ask God to help us to grow in faith? Or do we foolishly think we can make it on our own? I can speak from personal experience, it's better off to have the help. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. My, came, my mother was a great mother, a wonderful person. But if she didn't have something to worry about, she worried about what she was missing. But she grew up in the Depression and World War II and everything like that. She had reasons for that attitude. For all these things the nation of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Seeking the kingdom of God has to be our first priority. Our first priority, like is up in Saturn, our second, pa second priority is in the basement. It's got to be our first priority by far. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your pleasure, your Father's good pleasure, to give you the kingdom. And look around us, look in the church, we know we are a little flock. See what? You have and give alms. Provide yourself money bags, which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail, that no thief approaches, nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Second Kings 6, 8. People, God wants people to understand what it means that we cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is wealth 
and riches. We cannot live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. It doesn't work. We can't not live by godly f values on the Sabbath and worldly values the rest of the week. We have to live in this world. There's no getting away from it. But do we live by God's standards no matter what the people are doing around us? 2 Kings 6, 8. There is an interesting story here that most people think is a nice story for Sunday school. That, that's where I first heard about it. But there's some very important lessons for us here. Now the king of Syria is making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, Beware, they do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down here. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place which the man of God had told him. Thus he was warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. This happened repeatedly. Think of how nice it would be if God revealed to our military leaders the same type of information. We would know exactly where ISIS troops are located. The exact location of terrorist cells. But we'd have to ask, and I don't think that has even come up with any of our conferences that the President had with his military leaders. Let's pray and ask God to show us where our enemies are. Because they had to have to ask in faith. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who is the traitor? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words which you speak in your bedroom. He said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. As told him, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God wants his people in the world to see through the eyes of Elisha, not his servant. To know that God is with us. God is protecting us. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I play with blindness. And he stuck them with blindness, according to the words of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow we, me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. And it was that when he came to Samaria, the Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of the men, these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and they were inside Samaria. I would say at this point, they're extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> they're captured inside the city, and things didn't look too bright. Well, the king of Israel saw them. He said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill him? Shall I kill him? Seems like he almost wanted to kill them. This is our chance. Let us destroy these people now that we have the opportunity. But Elisha answered, you will not kill them. Will you kill those whom you have taken captive with a sword and your bow? This is not being read in the Middle East right now, by the way. <laughs> they kill their captives. Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and after they ate and drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. 
What was the result of doing it God's way? So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Human logic would dictate that you'd be better off if you killed that army. But that probably only brought vengeance from the king of Syria. They didn't follow, they followed God. As a result, the raid stopped. 2 Samuel 11.1 1. What we just read is an interesting story about Elisha for many reasons. One, it shows that God was with Israel. And he was protecting them by helping them avoid a superior force. Kind of makes you want to think, why didn't God just let them fight and give them victory? But he didn't. He kept them and made a way for them not to have to go to war. Elisha knew that God was protecting him. And it's interesting. He, the servant, even though he was around Elisha constantly, did not have Elisha's faith. Faith is a very personal thing. Elisha asked God that the enemy be blinded. But Elisha would not allow the blinded men to be harmed in any way. He showed compassion. Elisha asked God to give them back their eyesight. Now let's look at our, our current world situation. How many of us pray for ISIS? If there's any people on the face of the earth that no, need to know God's way of life, it's them. And we pray that God will send Jesus Christ back so that they can learn his way and give up the horrible way they're now following. Because eventually, they're going to be our subjects. Whether in the wonderful world tomorrow or at the great right throne judgment, we will deal with these people. Second Samuel 11.1 1. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. It's the story of a man of God that has gone seriously off track. And has some powerful lessons for us. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle. In this modern age, we're not limited by the weather. We can go to war any time we want to. Aren't we lucky? Yeah. <laughs> that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And then it happened one evening that Jesus arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. So someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? At that point, David who supposedly knew God's law and followed it, should have turned around and walked away. He did not. Consumed with desire, he forgot about God and his law. Then David sent messengers and took her. She came to him and he lay with her, for she was cleansed of her impurity, and she returned to her house. And that one night stand we tend to call these things, should have been the end of it. But then the whole thing blew up in David's face. Oftentimes when we sin, things have a habit of happening that way. Then the woman conceived. So he sent and told David and said, I am with child. David wanted to cover up his sin. In modern terms, we would call it spin control. Okay? Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab did as he was told. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and the people were doing, and how the war prospered. He really didn't care at this point. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. The Living Bible says, Then he told Uriah to go home and relax. And David sent a present to him at his home. 
But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord, of his Lord. It did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his, uh, his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why do you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Uriah was a man of honor. This makes what happened next even worse. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I'll let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. But David had a plan. He was not, had not given up. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him. And he made him drunk. All right, you won't do what I want you to do sober, so let's see how you do it if you're drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. David wanted Uriah and others to believe Uriah was the father of the child. David at this point was out of control. His lust had led to adultery, and now he is trying to manipulate Uriah. But things are about to get even worse. Far worse. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. Uriah did not know he was carrying his death warrant with him from the man he served and trusted. So it was... While Joab besieged the city, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people, the servants of David, fell. And Uriah, the Hittite, died also. Notice something here. Uriah was not the only one that died because of this. Now murder is added to the list. Now Joab goes ahead and sends uh, a message back to David about exactly what happened. He told the messenger to, you know, what to say and everything, and then if David questioned the wisdom of the actions, he was to tell him that his servant Uriah the Hittite was dead also. But verse 25, notice that the serpent, servant, <laughs> servant was no fool. He mentioned the death of, of Uriah without being asked. How many people did he tell this? Think about it. When David did this, he asked people who, who Bathsheba was. Then he sent messengers to Bathsheba that brought her to him. Then he sent this message to Joab. Joab sent the message. You wonder how many people actually knew what was going on. David's attempt to control this was not going very well, frankly. And David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the Lord devours one as well as another. That was a pretty uh, pathetic statement, frankly. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. It makes you wonder how many people died that day besides Uriah. We're not told. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. That was probably the understatement of the year. David at this point probably thought his troubles were over, but they were just beginning. We can hide our sins from others. We can even hide our sins 
from ourselves. We can make excuses. Well, it's not that big of a deal. God understands why I'm doing this. God understands why I'm not keeping the Sabbath as like I should be. You know, We cannot hide our sins from God. But notice how God dealt with David. Chapter 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought, brought, and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate his own food and drank from his own cup and lay on his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. You think it's kind of strange about talking about uh, an animal like this? You see the woman that got asked to li leave McDonald's in Australia because she brought her service animal with her into the restaurant, which was a baby kangaroo. <laughs> it's on the internet. It's got to be true, right? <laughs> I wonder, what do you do when the thing grows up? Yeah. I don't know. It's a wild animal. It belongs out there in the wild, frankly. Yeah. And the traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock, from his own herd, to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. Because of this, he did this thing and because he had no pity. David didn't know he was talking about himself. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This says the Lord God of Israel. I noted you, I'm king over Israel. I did over you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would also have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. And you killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. A little wrong set of scriptures I read to you here. But it point, uh, points out a danger for all of us. It is much easier for us to see the problems of somebody else than the problems that we ourselves have. But the big point we need to understand is sin always has a price. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up adversary, adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And she will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, I'll do this thing before all of Israel, before the sun. It was fulfilled in the rebellion of Absalom. But notice carefully the next statement. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The Lord, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Psalm 51. You know, you look at all the things that David did and that God forgave him. You understand the magnitude of God's forgiveness. And I don't think anybody in this room has done as much as David did in that short period of time. But does our conduct at work or school bring credit to God and his church, or does it cause people to look down on our calling? How we live our lives have an impact on the people around us.
he looked down upon us and saying, you know, goody two shoes or something. But, you know, you can stand up for God's way of life. It was interesting when I was actually working at Del Monte, we used to go out on a Friday for lunch every once in a while, and there was a Chinese restaurant that people liked to go to. Now, I love Chinese food, but for you, for most of us, that's American Chinese. You go to a Chinese Chinese restaurant, it's a little bit different. I told one lady that I worked with who actually had swum out of China into Hong Kong and then the United States that looked like her plate was going to crawl over into mine. You cannot believe what these people will eat. I like American Chinese food, but... Hmm. But as a, Psalm 51 is a prayer of repentance to the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Notice carefully the words that David wrote. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. We are rapidly approaching the Passover. It will once again show us the price that God paid because of our sins. Verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Do we acknowledge our sins to God? Or do we think they are no big deal? We as humans have a propensity to make excuses for ourselves while holding other people's feet to the fire, so to speak. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. This is very interesting. David committed adultery with Uriah's wife and then had Uriah murdered. But David points out that his sin was against God. Why? Because the God of the Old Testament had to pay the price of his sin. Think about it for, the mo for a moment. The God that was very angry over David's sin had the compassion to forgive him when David repented. Not only that, but that same God came to this earth and prayed the, paid the price for David's sins in his stead. The same holds true for our sins. The price is going to be paid for our sins. The question is, do we pay the price ourselves through eternal death, or do we accept Christ's sacrifice to do it and to seek his way of life? Because there's more to it than just saying, I accept Jesus as my Savior. It goes a lot further than that. God wants, when everything is said and done, a universe full of peace. Star Wars and all the other things that man can come up with will be a just forgotten completely. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and my, in sin my mother conceived me. Another translation says that I have sinned since I was born. Obviously, David was taking his sin very seriously. Do we? Do I? Like I said before, it's a lot easier for me to look it out and say, oh, somebody else has got a problem out there, than to look in the mirror and say, you know, i got a problem that i got to deal with. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. The parts that we keep hidden. The history of the modern church has shown that a lot of people's Christianity was simply a facade. It didn't stand up to the stress or when somebody gave them an excuse to leave. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. That sounds painful. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones ye have broken may rejoice. That also sounds a little painful. We can learn lessons about sin the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is to study God's word 
We come about because something we're doing wrong, we repent, we change. Or we can go ahead and sin and suffer the penalty and learn the hard way. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. God, David wanted to get back to the point where he kept God's law without wavering before all this happened. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew his eternal life was in grave danger. Sin is dangerous. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. David did not point about all the things he had done as king. He threw himself fully on God's mercy. Then I'll teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted to you. Lure me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Many of the songs we sing weekly are based on David's psalms. We still sing them. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall f show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, and else I would give it to you. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. As I said before, we are rapidly approaching the Passover. We need to realize that we cannot make the kingdom of God on our own. This is the time of Adam and Eve. Since the time of Adam and Eve, Satan has been the God of this world. The people of God has always had to struggle against the influence of Satan's world. No era of God's church got a free pass in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine what it would be like to have lived as a Christian when the black plague was killing the majority of the human race? They must have thought they were living in the end time. We're nowhere near that point. On my wall at home, I have a, a, some pictures. One of the pictures is of a, two little twin boys, about four years old. It's my father and his brother. My father was born in 1910. He's four years old. The guns of August had already started blazing. The guns of August marked the start of World War I. That changed the world completely. Before that time, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had an emperor, Germany had a Kaiser, Russia had a Tsar. They were all gone. The world was completely transformed. They lived under there. They lived through the Great Depression. And believe me, the Depression in those days started much earlier on the farms than it did on Wall Street. Then after that, they had to face World War II. They had a really tough life. As bad as these times are, it is hard being a true Christian in the world. The worst is yet to come. We still have time to strengthen our foundation before the storms come. But even the great tribulation does not come in our lifetime we still have to live in this world. Resisting the world breeds, builds character. Do not focus so much on the future tribulation and as a result, underestimate the dangers of this current society. Our only choice, really, is to stay close to God. Get your mind focused on the Passover. Think about it what it means to you, what it means to all of us. And know that we have to dedicate ourselves to seeking the kingdom of God. That is the only way that we can live forever.